Let me fill you in a little bit about this new series we're about to start this morning for four Sundays called Nothing But the Truth. Several months ago, I got an email from Dr. Adrian Rogers, who's now in heaven, his ministry that his, his uh, people and his children, they want to continue his great preaching ministry. He's one of the greatest preachers of the 20th and early 21st century before the Lord took him home. In fact, we're going to show a video in just a minute, and you'll hear his voice. You'll recognize it right away. It's a very uh, familiar voice to a lot of people. But he uh, had a, a deep, deep uh, burden for America, for the truth of God's word. And so what his ministry did is they put together some videos for the local church that pastors can use. And what we're going to do this morning, before I even say a word from, from the Word of God, I'm going to go ahead and get us started by showing one of these. Each Sunday for the next four weeks, including today, we're going to do a 10-minute video that they've put together. Uh, what they've done is they've actually done a, a movie that's over an hour long about this topic but thankfully for churches, they've been able to, to take the gist of that movie and break it down into four different 10-minute uh, segments. So it's not quite the whole thing, but over the next several weeks, you're going to get to hear from people like Johnny Hunt, Robert Jeffress, Mike Huckabee, um, uh, Tony Evans. There's just going to be some great interviews among uh, pastors, evangelists, uh, you're going to hear from Lee Strobel. Uh, it's just going to be really, really great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these videos and basically uh, form a message with the gist of these videos, like today the video is on what is truth. And by the way, I'd like the three gentlemen that I handed those handouts to, would you please stand and come forward? And we've got three men, one for each each section, come on forward and make sure everybody gets one of these to fill out during the service. Uh, they're going to get those to you, and while they're doing that, I'm going to go ahead in just a second and, and start this video, but this video today is on the topic, what is truth? And it's going to talk about how the fact that in our country, and especially in these last 20, 25 years, our country has just basically uh, wholesale rejected the truth of God's word, the Judeo-Christian uh, foundation our country was built on, and, and it's just caused a, an awful upheaval in our country. Nowadays, people talk about, they're going to talk about it over and over and over about this idea of my truth. You know, basically what they ought to say is my opinion, because it's really not truth. Truth is solid. Truth is objective. Truth is something that's set in stone. Jesus said, thy word is truth. And he was speaking to his father. That's the truth. Okay, that's reality. What happens in eternity? It's in God's word. That's the truth. Not what we think it is. Well, I think that it ought to be like this. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter our opinion. But you know what? Our world is given over to this idea of, it's, I have my truth, you have your truth. So today, we're going to answer that question, what is truth? But let's begin. And Daniel, are you ready? Go ahead and fire that, that video up. And as soon as it comes on, I'll sit down. But I want you all to keep that in focus. I want you to think about this idea of God's truth. Okay. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he said, I am the way, he implied that men are lost and need a way. When he said, I am the truth, he implied that men are in error and need light. And when he said, I am the life, he implied that men are dead and need a new birth. And all of those are wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the truth. Now, cynical Pilate 
Ask the Lord Jesus, what is truth? <laughs> and truth was looking him right in the face. In John 18, there was a moment where Pilate asked the question to Jesus and said, what is truth? And Jesus, in his prior statement, said, I've come to deliver truth. And so when you think about truth, it's what is absolute for all people, all places, all times. It stands in contrast to what our society chooses to believe, which is relativism from the perspective of we get to define truth, but truth is not something that we define. Truth has already been defined. What is truth? Is there a universal truth? Is there something outside of our opinions? Is there something outside of what I think? Or is there, uh, is truth just relative? I mean, I have my truth, you have you, your truth. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. And people like to conflate their opinion with the truth. They say, it's my truth which is idiotic. There's no such thing as your truth. Is it something that uh, varies from person to person? Or is there an ultimate truth that we can uh, build our lives on? Uh, that, that was an important question for me. Well, if you don't start from a proposition that things are true and things are not true, it's hard to have a conversation. It's hard to have a civil society. It's hard to have a family. You have to start with a foundation of something uh, that, that can be agreed on in order to even be in any kind of a community. For me, and I think for many of us, uh, Jesus is the truth. He declared himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so it starts with Jesus and what's revealed about him in the Bible. Uh, and of course, the Bible itself we know to be true. Uh, and that was the foundation of everything in our nation, in Western civilization, was that was the truth of scripture. And we need to return to that. Biblical truth means that there is a standard. There's something that is objectively true. You don't have to believe it to be true for it to be true. Gravity, for example. I can say I don't believe in gravity, but if I jump off a building, gravity is going to make a believer out of me. Biblical truth means that there's something that is objective above and beyond what I think, feel, or believe. And belief is great. Thinking is great. Feeling is great. But believing, thinking, and feeling do not substitute for reality. Biblical truth in the purest sense is not just that I believe it to be true, it's true because it is definably true. It is objectively true. It is demonstrably true. And that's the only kind of truth that really matters. And biblical truth is that kind of truth. Paul said that we're to preach the word. This is a good word for all of us in season and out of season. Now, Stephen Olford, I heard him preach that past and he said, there's no closed season on preaching. Um, that's good, but here's another word for today. <laughs> There's some of the things we're dealing with now that was easier to deal with 20 years ago because it was not in season. And most preachers have quit dealing with the in-season subjects, okay? And so what we need to do is be faithful in season and out of season. So. And, and we, we know, we know for a fact there's people to say, <clears throat> if I were writing the sermon today, I wouldn't have written it like I did 20 years ago. What they're saying is, I would handle it differently now that it's in season. But well, wait a minute, did you tell the truth back then? So it's not my duty to change the truths. Well, you cannot replace lies with truth unless you know the truth. So the first thing you have to do is begin to recognize truth. and. Part of the way that I've learned to recognize truth, especially about the truths that I say to myself or that I try to feed my soul with, is I really begin to ask myself, what is this based upon? Is it based upon my emotion? Is it based upon something I've heard? Or is it based upon the truth of God's Word? When we think about biblical standards, look at it in the context of standards. I'm a musician and I know that if the instrument I'm playing isn't tuned, I don't care what the song is, it's not going to sound right. And the degree to which it is not in tune is the degree to which it will sound more like a train wreck than a song. The Bible is our tuning fork. It's how we tune our lives so that uh, our lives are in harmony with reality, with truth, with God. And if we don't have something objective to tune to, if everyone tunes to a different source, and that source is not constant, it's not fixed. Imagine uh, the, the complete disarray. This is true going into a kitchen to prepare a recipe. 
a cup of something ought to mean the same thing, whatever kitchen you're in. A teaspoon ought to always mean the same measure, no matter what kitchen you're in. And if in every kitchen you go to, a cup means in some places this much liquid, in some places this much, clearly uh, there's going to be chaos in the kitchen. It's really impossible to recognize a lie unless you know truth. The only way you can ever discern a lie is to be able to compare it with the truth. And ultimately, ultimately, Jesus is truth. I mean, there's so many people in our society today who talk about having their own truth. Y'all, I, I do not want my own truth because I don't trust me enough to have my own truth. I have decided that I'm going to find the truth according to the one who proclaimed to be the truth the way, the truth, and the life. And when I put my life and my thoughts up against His life and His teachings, then I'm able to really know the truth, and that truth sets me free from the lies which could bind me and confuse me and keep me believing <laughs> the, the deception that I think I know the truth. And I even hear people blatantly say, well, my truth is, and then they'll finish that sentence. It's as if we all have a right to our own individual version of what truth is. Well, truth is objective. Truth cuts across what I think, what I feel, what I believe. And it's the single most dangerous aspect of our culture today is this notion that we are our own gods. Because if I'm God, then what I think really matters. If I'm God, what I believe really matters. If I'm God, what I feel really matters. But if I'm not God, I need to make sure that what I think, what I believe, and what I feel matches up to something bigger than me. I think uh, a couple of the biggest lies that are affecting our culture, number one is the nature of truth. It's that truth is relative. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth, doesn't really matter uh, what people believe, that creates reality. That is a very damaging lie not to believe that there is an objective reality that we must align our lives with, that we, we could discover and that we can know to be true. That's a very damaging lie. I think the, uh, the lie about Jesus. You know, we have uh, billions of people in the world who uh, deny the essential truth that Jesus is the unique Son of God. I mean, for instance, if you look at Islam, it specifically denies that God has a son, it specifically denies that anyone can bear the burdens or the sins of another. It specifically denies that Jesus died on the cross. I mean, these are fundamental uh, facts that um, um, we can investigate historically in terms of the resurrection and come to a conclusion that Jesus did indeed die on the cross and he was resurrected from the dead. But the lie that uh, Jesus is just another teacher, that he's just another religious leader, that he's no more credible than Gandhi or Mohammed or somebody else, uh, that's a very damaging lie. And, it, and it's one that is easily exposed when we take the time to investigate the, the firm foundation upon which Christianity rests. Uh, so my name is uh, KJ52. I am a Christian hip hop artist. Uh, but I did not know who Christ was. Uh, I was in a, a private Catholic school, but honestly, mostly all I learned was morality. I didn't really learn what it meant to have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. I'm never really quite fitting in. I'm, I'm the poorest kid in a rich neighborhood. I'm the whitest kid in a black neighborhood. I am all the things that you don't want to be when you're a teenager. You want to just blend in. Uh, but I never did blend in. The world that I was in of art and music um, truth is very relative. Truth is what you make it. Truth is whatever you feel it is. There's no, no such thing as a defined truth. And so I reflected that in my mind. And so by the time I hit seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I was pretty much agnostic. And this time I am just 100% full on with hip hop. That is my life. I didn't know if God was Muslim, Baptist, Jehovah Witness, Pentecostal, Catholic. I had no idea. All I knew is that I wanted truth. I wanted to find something solid in a very chaotic world. I think the biggest lie of this generation is the one that says that all roads lead to God. That all religions are essentially the same. That all
teachers of that religion are essentially teaching the exact same thing. Uh, well, of course, I would acknowledge that there are similarities between Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, Jesus, etc., etc. The greatest lie is that all things are on the same equal footing and that it's all identical, and yet Jesus literally says, I am it. If we go back 25 years ago, in 1996, one of the most well, uh, best-selling books in 96 was this book called Conversations with God. It sold over two and a half million copies. And the author, Neil Donald Walsh, says that one day he simply started writing down his conversations with God. Now, the God he speaks about is not the God of the Bible, nor is this God identified with any major religion. But Walsh's God is definitely a God that the bulk of Americans, the majority of Americans, would really like. In this following conversation, I'm going to put on the screen in, from Walsh's book, Between Him and God. These are conversations with God. In fact, after this book, he went on to write at least four more books. I saw there's an entire set of them, like conversations with God, one, two, three, four, you know, he's got multiple books he wrote over time. But this guy is way off, and I want you to see, though, the way human, humans think about God, about truth, okay? Okay, first of all, God's talking to Donald Walsh, supposedly. I cannot tell you my truth until you stop telling me yours, Walsh. But my truth about God comes from you. Who said so? Others. What others? Leaders, ministers, rabbis, priests, books, the Bible for heaven's sake. Those are not authoritative sources. They aren't? No. Then what is? Listen to your feelings. Listen to your highest thoughts. Listen to your experience. Whenever any one of these differ from what you've been told by your teachers or read in your books, forget the words. Forget the words. Now, the view of truth we see in this story is extremely popular. This is from 25 uh, years ago. 20, yeah, 25 years ago. And yet, this is just as popular today and even more so than it was then. And this has been going on, by the way, for thousands of years. You only need to turn to Genesis chapter 3, right? And what's Satan saying to Adam and Eve? Did God say? Did God say? It's been going on for thousands of years. In our world, truth is not objective data that can be studied. It's not objective. It's not set in stone. The world doesn't see truth that way. Um, truth is what your feelings say to you about life. That's the way the world defines truth now. It's your feelings. It's your opinions about your life. And when your feelings differ from what you've read in books, like the Bible, always go with your feelings, they say, your truth. If you go back a year, uh, in 2020, Barna did a poll of Americans, and 58% of Americans rejected the existence of moral absolutes. And I put in parentheses, moral absolutes are decrees or laws or commandments that are true for all people at all times. Like we would say, for instance, thou shalt not kill. That's true always and everywhere in every generation for every nation, for every tribe, for every tongue, for every person on earth. That is set in stone by God and so on and so forth. Go through the Ten Commandments. All right? In his book entitled The Body, Charles Colson 
of course, who was wrapped up in Watergate back in the 1970s. And while he was in prison for Watergate and for what he did, he became a born-again believer. In fact, he wrote a book entitled Born Again. And Charles Colson, in his book that he wrote entitled The Body Before the Lord Took Him Home, he said, and it's in your notes there, the very first thing there, he said that moral relativism is the reigning orthodoxy or belief of American life. Moral relativism. Everything when it comes to right and wrong is relative. If it might be right for you and it might be wrong for somebody else. Moral relativism. Uh, whatever you think is true is true, moral relativism. Whatever you think is right, is right. Humorously, Colson wrote these words. There are no absolutes except the absolute that there can be no absolute. <laughs> and that's the way our world thinks. If you go back 2,000 years ago, Pontius Pilate, Jesus is standing before him. He asked the question of the ages when truth incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ stood before him on trial. This is what Pilate said, or Je I'm sorry, this is what Jesus said to Pilate. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I shall, should bear witness to the truth. Okay, you know what witness is, bearing witness, okay? They have you put your hand on the Bible and raise your hand when you... When you go into a courtroom as a witness or to give a testimony, your, your testimony about what happened, and they make you swear on the Bible, okay, Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth. Notice how he put that. Not a truth, the truth. He said, that's why I've come to this earth, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears or listens to my voice. They listen to what I say, and they take that as the God-honest truth. They don't say, no, you know what, that's just Jesus' opinion. No, he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Probably he most likely was saying that sarcastically like that. <laughs> what is truth? You know, Jesus is standing before him. He's been ripped to shreds by the cat of nine tails and he's like, what is truth? But if Pilate really wanted to know the answer to that question, Jesus could have given it to him because the very night before Jesus was standing before him, Jesus said these very words as he prayed in the garden to his father. Notice John 17, 17. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Sanctify them. Jesus is praying to God the Father. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the question before us this morning, everybody, is this. This is the title of my message. What is truth? What is it? And we're going to give you three main points about truth. Now, we're going to give you a lot of subpoints, but we're going to give you three main points, and we're going to contend absolutely, positively, that the Bible is truth. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, Jesus said, your word, O Father, is truth. And this series is going to revolve around this idea of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So let's pray, then we'll jump right into this, okay? Father in heaven, we just pray that you'll use this in all of our lives. Lord, if we are not thinking clearly about this, we are in a heap of trouble as individuals, as a church family, and Lord, in our world toward those who are all around us. Lord, if we don't understand what is truth, we cannot function the way you intend us to function. And so, Father, I just pray that today in these next several weeks, Lord, you will work mightily in our hearts and lives and that we will be transformed 
by the renewing of our mind, Father. God, use this in our lives, in our church. And Lord, with so many who watch from afar, and we pray these things in your precious name, Jesus, and for your sake, amen. <clears throat> now, the world around us is completely confused about what truth is. And this is a problem as we, that we face as God's people living in a society with practically no, no morals, a society that says, I'll decide for myself what's right and wrong. I'll make that decision, which is what we call moral relativism, okay? You know, most, most Americans and most people that are walking the earth do not believe there is a fixed truth. Remember, Mike Huckabee was talking about tuning fork. Or you could look at it as a compass that points to true north. Most people don't believe that. They believe that you make it up as you go, which is relativism. Now, here's, here's a time where we start filling in the blanks. What are some of the prominent views on what truth is? There's all kinds of views on what is truth, okay? First, you have the deniers, okay? You've got those who say that truth does not exist. Truth does not exist, okay? This is the person who simply dismisses and rejects the very concept of truth. No absolutes, they say. There's no rules, no decrees, no divine law that's true for all people everywhere at all times, of course, the book of Romans tells us why people take this view, why there are these deniers. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, oh, I guess I didn't put it on the screen. It's in your notes, though, I believe. Yeah, it's on the top of page 2. Look at the top of page 2. This tells us the wrath of God, the anger of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men or humanity. By the way, everyone, this is true of you and me. And it's true of all the people that, that uh, don't know God or have rejected God, okay? No human being can escape the wrath of God because it's revealed against all ungodliness, okay? So even when we do things that displease God, God's anger is aroused, okay? But it goes on to say here, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of humanity who sub who suppress the truth. You know what? Even believers do that sometimes. They say, well, I know God says that I shouldn't steal, but you know what? It's so easy for me to steal from my workplace that I just can't help myself. They're suppressing the truth. God says, don't take what is not yours, okay? Do not steal. Do not, you know, you got all of the do nots in the Ten Commandments, okay? It says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Listen, everyone on earth, because of the Imago Dei, because of the image of God that we were created with. Listen, if somebody comes into your house and takes your, let's say you just cashed your whole paycheck and there's $400 sitting on the counter and somebody comes in your house with a gun and they say, give me that money, you don't go, hey, no problem. That's your truth. You can have it. If you believe that's yours, that's your truth. No problem. No, everybody that gets robbed when that robber takes off with the cash says, I've been violated. That's wrong. And you know what? It's inside of humans. Listen, they could be some place on earth where things are very backward. There's illiteracy. People it could be just a really sad situation. And guess what? Those people know if, if somebody steals from them that they've been wronged. See, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. It's called the conscience. He puts it in humanity. You don't even have to have ever cracked the Bible to know this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. It's built into humans. Not perfectly, but in such a way that's good enough for human life to flourish and to function. Okay, that's number one. What's another view of truth? Okay, you got the deniers that are suppressing the truth. Number two is the agnostics, and basically they say truth can't really be known. That's their view. The word agnostic means ah, without, no, and knowledge. You know, the Gnostics in the 
that the New Testament alludes to, okay, these false teachers that in Paul's day and afterwards means without knowledge. Thus, the agnostic's answer to Pilate's question, what is truth, would be, I don't know. Agnostics say truth can't be known, and they leave it at that. Some people say, I'm an agnostic, okay, which is not true. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth can be known. So, er, survey said, number two, er, the truth can be known. To say you're agnostic is not going to let you escape from reality, which is you will die, and you will stand before God, and you will give an account before the God who created you. Number three, another view of truth is rationalists. And they just basically say what we've been saying all morning. Truth is for you to, to decide. Just be rational. Just be smart. Love everybody. Don't, don't hurt other people. And they can have their truth. You can have your truth. And everything will be good. And the rationalist looks to human reason and experience, the ultimate criteria for determining truth. Rationalism focuses on the mind and simply says whatever the mind conceives of being reality is reality. It's, in fact, the truth. And this view reminds me and reminds you as well of the last verse in the book of Judges, which was what? Every person did what was right in their own mind. Right. <laughs> That's rationalism. Okay, what about the next one, the pragmatics? Okay, pragmatism is what works. Okay, a pragmatist says, I like this system because this system just works. Okay, but... If they say truth is whatever works, for instance, abortionists would be pragmatists. They would say, you know what? Abortion is what's right because these people can't afford children and they're poor and they're poverty stricken. So there's no reason why they should have to keep their ch ch child or their children. There's no reason they should need to do that because we've got a system that works here. You know, if you keep bringing children into the world, one, two, three, four, five, and you keep multiplying those children, you'll never get out of poverty. So pragmatist says, hey, obviously, what is the truth for humanity, the correct way for humanity is for abortion to go forward. Okay, number five, uh, religionists. This would get into people who are, are religious in some way, and they say truth is my religious opinion. This is what I believe about life and how your life should be lived. And it's my opinion. And you can have your opinion from your religion and I'll have mine. And this may be the hardest person of all to deal with because he's the guy who claims to be a follower of God and a seeker after spiritual truth. They want to decide what truth is. I remember about five or six years ago, uh, a Jehovah's Witness woman came by my house with her young teenage daughter, and they, they started to talk to me. And, of course, I look at this as opportunities to share the good news with them. And so I began to talk to them because they were telling me that, you know, uh, good works are part of being with God forever and ever. Only a small number of people are going to get to be with God, the 144,000, and so it's going to be the people who cranked out the most good works, they would say, for the kingdom hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. But you know what? As I began to share scripture with her, she realized, uh-oh, I better get out of here right away because my daughter is hearing things that aren't true. And so she said, do you mind if I come back with our elder from our kingdom hall? I said, no, no problem. And so next week, the, the elder from the kingdom hall came and and so we started talking about it, and I said, hey, last week, uh, this dear lady here said that e your eternal life is based on the good that you do. And he said, absolutely, Zephaniah 3.2, Zephaniah 3.2. And I said, okay, well, let's see what that says. So I grab a Bible, and I look at it, and it has nothing at all, there's nothing said in the verse at all about eternal life, about eternity or anything like that. It's just like a nebulous verse about, you know, doing good or whatever. And so I started to talk to this man, and before long, he knew he was over his head because I kept sharing 
Bible verses with him that he couldn't refute. I mean, I was looking at clear, easy to understand verses where Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. It is the gift of God, eternal life, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, he didn't know what to do with those. So suddenly, the elder's gone, and so now you've got the lady and her daughter and the elder all tied up in knots because they were seeing with their own eyes right out of Scripture, and they probably had no idea those verses were in there. But anyway, Jesus referred to himself as the truth. He didn't say, I am a way, a truth, a life. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. He called the word of God the truth. So you've got Jesus. He's the ultimate in reality. Jesus is the ultimate and the word of God is the truth in written form. Obviously, Jesus is in ultimate form because the Bible could only contain so much. It's given, God's given to us, uh, Second P Peter, all that we need for life and godliness. But let me tell you, we're going to learn about God. We're going to learn about the truths of God that we've never heard forever and ever and ever. And guess what? Because God is, um, he is perfection because he's beyond all that we can ask or think. Every day of eternity, obviously, there are, uh, there's undoubtedly not going to be time in eternity. Time will be no more. But nonetheless, if you think of, of as we think about it, God could get up every day forever and ever and ever and tell us a new truth about himself and never run out. <laughs> Think about that. But he gives us in his word everything we need for, so we can know about eternity, about where we're going to go when we die, about how we should treat one another, how we should treat uh, our Christian brothers and sisters, how we should treat those without Jesus. So Jesus called himself the truth. He called the word of God the truth. Now, what else can we glean? So let me give you those three points very quickly, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper, okay? Let's do that, and we're going to start out with number one here. Okay, first we've got to focus on the nature of truth, what truth is like, okay? The Bible clearly distinguishes what is actual and what is genuine from what is false, okay? The Bible delineates between those. To say that something is true or false only makes sense if those two realities exist. There might be people who say, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. So they don't believe in either of those. <laughs> they just believe that everybody's got their opinion, but God is clear. There is truth and there are lies. Okay? Jesus says, my word is truth. So anything that goes against Scripture is a lie, okay? And boy, I could stand here for two hours and talk about our society, and they'll say, this is what's right for human beings? And I'll say, no, because thus says the Lord. <laughs> you know, some people say, well, you know, some people, probably not wrong for them to steal because they're in such desperate straits, and they just have to do that, or they have to inject themselves with drugs, or they need to do this or that. And God would say, uh, no, because I say, ta-da, 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 and this is the truth, and it is not a lie, okay? So the Bible says that not only truth exists, but that it's knowable, and we can know it if we truly desire to know it. And like I said earlier, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus clearly said, Jesus is God Almighty, and he says, oh, you can know what's true. And guess what? Not only that, that truth will set you free. It'll set you free. Hey, when we look at what's wrong with our society, let me ask you a question. You see things going wrong everywhere all around us, 
And guess what? You could take the things that are going wrong and open the Bible and turn to a scripture that, and it says, if, so, if people do thus and such, they will suffer the consequences. <laughs> it's, it's there over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, it's so clear. I mean, that's why they don't give gold medals out to people that murder other people, <laughs> right? It's not like society says, oh, you know what, that's just fine. You know, somebody gets you mad, you know, they cut you off. Just pull out your 9 millimeter and, and blow their brains out, okay? Even our wicked society would, would admit that that is evil, okay? Jesus said that truth was not only noble, but he said it's powerful, because it's the way to true freedom. It will set you free. The truth is noble. The truth is powerful. Now, I'd like you to notice, and I pointed this out, Jesus puts the definite article, the. Okay, that's the definite article. Not a indefinite article. The is the definite article. For Jesus, truth was a definite body of material, a definite body of reality, a definite body of, of words put on a page which tells us what is right and what is wrong. So this morning, what we want to seek to establish is that this body of truth called the truth is the Bible, okay? We're talking about the nature of truth. Okay, letter A, quickly. There are many claims to truth today, okay? That's clear. Many around us say there's such a thing as truth, but there's no such thing as a truth that's the same for every person in every place and every time. In other words, the truth is whatever is right for you. Or they'll say the truth is determined by the majority. Let's take a poll. When the majority say it's right, it's right. Hey, by the way, the majority said Jesus should be crucified. The majority is often wrong, okay? The majority is often wrong. So taking an opinion poll, voting on it, the answer with the most percentage points, that is not qualify for the truth. I'll give you an example. How many of you have seen the TV show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, right? And you get three helps, right? You get a phone a friend, or you get the ask the audience, right? So a lot of people that don't know the answer, like they, let's say they're at like, $64,000, you know, and they've got $64,000, and they could lose that if they get the wrong, you know, they're at the last, at the very end of their ability to, to give a wrong answer, and they say, well, I'll ask the audience. And so everybody punches the answer in, and then the person uh, hears what the, uh, what the majority has suggested is the right answer, and... Uh, they say, wow, I, I don't know. Uh, if, I, if I take the answer they gave, uh, I could lose all my money. But they don't have any recourse. So they say, well, the majority is normally right. So they'll say, I'm going to go with the, what the audience said. Answer B. And it's the wrong answer, and they're off the show. They just lost $64,000 because they listened to the majority. I saw that happen all the time. Okay? Because a lot of times... the the majority doesn't know the answer. That's true, okay? The majority is often wrong. Jesus was crucified by the majority. That's number, or letter A, of concerning the nature of truth. Letter B, truth conforms to the nature of God. That goes without saying. The word of God and God Almighty himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, those both have to be in perfect harmony. The Bible can't say one thing and then Jesus be something different, okay? 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, okay? We, as Christians, could make a definitive statement about truth because of the, of the perfectly true nature of God, okay? 1 John 5, 20 talks about him who is true the true God, and eternal life, okay? Him who is true. God can't have any falsity in him. He can't have any lies in him. 
Okay? Now, when men set out to divine God on their own, like Donald Walsh did that we saw at the beginning of this service, they always end up making untrue statements. But notice how perfect and uh, how God's perfect and sinless nature. Notice how God's perfect and sinless nature comes into play in the matter of determining truth. Look at Numbers 23 up here on the screen. God is not a man that he should lie. Okay? God's not a human. God doesn't lie. Look at Titus 1-2. God, who cannot lie, <laughs> guess what? Not only has God never lied, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God's nature is the standard for what is true. Remember, Mike Huckabee said, hey, you better hope that if you're in this kitchen that a cup is a cup. And in the next kitchen, it's not two cups. Because if you put two cups of flour in and thinking that it's the same as one cup of flour, you're in big trouble. It's going to be awful. It's going to be horrible what you're making. Jesus said, and of course, we've pointed this out, I am the truth. I am the truth. The world around us says that truth is whatever we want to make it. But God says truth must conformed, conform to a fixed standard. It's just like on a compass. That compass is pointing to true north. And if it's not, you can get into a heap of trouble. If it's actually pointing just a little bit off, it's got to be right on the money. It's just like, look, if I gave you a sheet of paper and I gave you a pencil and I said, sit down here at this desk and I want you to draw a straight line, okay? I want you to draw a straight line. Guess what? None of us could draw a perfectly straight line. We could get close, but you know what? If somebody took a ruler that was nice and, and sharp and, and, and awesome and took that and drew the line above it, you would see that yours is slightly off, okay? What we need is that standard for what is straight, what is true, what is a perfectly straight line, and we could get that for the most part. I don't want to get too technical, but if you use that ruler every time, whatever paper you put that on, as long as you're careful as you're drawing that line, it's going to be a straight line. And since God is by nature true... There's no lie in God. Something, for something to be true, in order for it to be true, it must conform to him and it must conform to his written revelation because Jesus said, thy word is truth. Okay? So that's the nature of truth. God. God is the standard. He is truth. Jesus is truth. Now, what about the source of truth? Okay, where can you and I go to it? Well, the Bible is totally and completely unique. There's no book like it in the world. It's completely reliable. And since that's the case, we take Jesus at his word when he says things like this, and we've been referencing this. Sanctify them. He's praying to his Father. Father, sanctify. Make my people holy by your truth. Your word is truth. There it is. What's the source of, source of truth? Your word. Now, of course, Jesus is the truth. And when people, when he was on earth and people saw Jesus and what he did, everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said, everything Jesus thought was the truth. He could do no other because he is truth. But guess what? Jesus isn't here anymore. He's not here for us to look at like a compass, like true north. So what does he leave for us? He leaves for us his perfectly uh, infallible, perfect word of God, all right? Your word is truth. And he gave us the Bible through divine inspiration. Okay, what's divine inspiration? Okay, the Holy Spirit oversaw the writing of Scripture so that there could be no contamination in it. Humans penned it. But the Holy Spirit made sure everything that they put down was perfect, okay? He used their personality. He used their style. He used their, uh, their uh, way of writing. But as he did that, he made sure that that human being made no mistake. Every, look at the scripture. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That in the Greek is literally, all scripture is God breathed. It's God's word. It's perfect. If God breathed it out, then it's got to be perfect. It can't have truth and error. And like I said in my Bible fellowship class, a lot of uh, academia, they want to talk about how the Bible's geographically deficient, how it's scientifically deficient, how it's medically deficient. That's interesting. There's a famous article in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that talks about Jesus' crucifixion. <laughs> and this is in a peer-reviewed journal, one of the finest medical journals that's trusted implicitly by the medical uh, hierarchy in the world. And basically, their thoughts of what's written in there is you can basically take most of what's written in this journal to the bank. And, and there was a medical doctor that wrote on the crucifixion of Jesus, and he said there is not one iota of medical abnormality in what the Bible says about the crucifixion of Jesus. Like when the, when the soldier took the sword and stabbed Jesus and it said that water and blood spilled out, man, they know exactly what happened. That that sword pierced the fluid sac around the heart and exactly what came out was what would be expected to come out and they went on and on on how, you know, the Bible is a masterpiece about what happens to a human being that endures the kind of suffering that Jesus endured. A perfect and true God cannot breathe out or author something that is not perfect and true, okay? So if anybody says to you, oh, the Bible, it's full of lies, it's full of all kinds of errors, geographically, historically, medically, scientifically, ask them, okay, uh, can you show me one? Ask them the question. Put them on the offensive, or on the defensive, I should say. Make them cough it up. Oh, okay, like what? <laughs> Show me how it's uh, geographically incorrect. And then if they have an answer, then hopefully you can answer them back, or you can say, listen, you know what? I had never heard that view, but if you'll give me an opportunity, I'd like to study that a little bit on my own and get back with you. Is that all right with you? But there's no errors and no lies in Scripture. People can, can make those, that, those hypotheses, but there's just no way that that holds water. The apostles, the other men who experienced divine inspiration, were so convinced of the validity of Scripture, guess what? They were willing to die for God's Word even to the point of awful suffering and death. So number one, the nature of truth. The nature of truth conforms to God's nature. The source of truth, number two, is God himself. All scripture is God-breathed. Finally, number three, the inerrancy of truth. And we've already talked about this a little bit, but let's just talk about it a little more. It means without error. Inerrant is without error. Now, some people will say the Bible contains truth or the Bible contains the Word of God, but that's only half the truth, okay? That's that kind of talking, and it's been very famous over the centuries. It only contains the truth. That's half the truth because it leaves open the possibility that the Bible also contains other things. Well, the Bible contains the truth. Well, what else does it contain? If it's not all the truth, then what else does it contain? Okay? The inerrancy of Scripture means the Bible is true no matter what the subject. <laughs> if it's talking about geography, no errors. If it's talking about something medical, no errors. If it's talking about something scientific, no errors. All right? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there aren't some things in the Bible that are not answerable. There are things that people will say, well, what about this? And there, there are actually things, not very many, and they don't have anything to do with heaven or hell, but there are, diffi there are difficulties where 
Christian scholars have not been able to answer those questions. But guess what? Those are very far and few between. And it shouldn't surprise us that there are things in the Bible that humans have not been able to come up with a good answer to why that is as it is written. But I'm just saying, when they start throwing out things like, oh, there's geography and history and science, and they'll just spout it off like it's everywhere, and just, you just ask them, okay, can you name two or three, please? Oh, uh, uh, I, uh, okay. People say, the Bible's filled with these different errors, but they say that's okay because the Bible's not meant to be a textbook. Like, it's not meant to be a book about history. It's not made to be a book about science. But that just doesn't hold water, everybody. They say, oh, it's just, all it needs to be uh, good in is about matters of faith. That's not true. It needs to be correct and the truth about every area, or we can't trust it in any area. Look, if it's wrong about geography, then it's wrong about eternal life. It's wrong about heaven and hell. We can't, we can't trust it. We can't have any knowledge that what we're believing is the truth. But we can take Jesus at his word. He says, thy word is truth. Okay? I want to, just before I share the Lord's table with you, I want to talk about one little story here. And it's about a famous professor from years gone by, Robert Wilson. He was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. Robert Wilson was an amazing man. I've told you about him before. When he was young, like in college age, he said to God, he said, God, I want to, I want to live for 45 years more. I'd like for 15 years to study and learn. I, he, he, by the way, he learned 45 languages fluently. He spent 15 years studying the languages the Old Testament was written in, all the different languages. Of course, the language was originally written in Hebrew, but it was translated. He said, I want to see how they translated that a thousand years ago. And so... He, the first 15 years when he was in college, when he got his doctorate, he studied and he learned 45 languages in 15 years. And then he asked God, he said, when he was young, he said, Lord, I'd like to, to study and learn languages for about 15 years, and then I'd like to teach what I've learned for 15 years, and then I would like to write down for the last 15 years of my life, and listen to me, everybody, he lived exactly 45 years after he asked God to do that. It's an amazing story. But anyway, he knew all these languages. Throughout his life, he dealt with attack after attack after attack on God's word. And I want you to read a quote that he wrote after all these years of people attacking the Bible and attacking the Bible. And this is what this man who knew the Bible in 45 languages wrote. He said, I've come to the conviction that no man knows enough to attack the veracity, the truthfulness of the Old Testament. Every time when anyone has been able to get together enough documentary proofs to undertake an investigation, the biblical facts in the original text have victoriously met the test. He says, you know what? I've been doing this for 45 years, and every attack that people have brought to me as a scholar, he says, oh, I can answer that. I can answer that. And he would take them to the Bible and show them beyond a shadow of a doubt that what the Bible said was the truth. The Word of God, everybody, listen to me carefully. The Word of God is always right. It's the truth. In fact, the Old Testament, Psalm 119, it says that it's been forever settled in heaven. It will never adjust to you and I. Never. But 
it will do wonders for you and I when we adjust to it. That's what I want you to take home with you. Okay? I'll reread that. It, the Word of God will never adjust to you because it's settled in heaven forever. But it will do wonders for you when you adjust to it. And so this week, I want to continue to encourage you. You know, during the summer, I had the series on how we need God's word in our lives. We've got to be taking it in, taking it in, and then lifting up prayer to God for a miracle of transformation. Listen, I've been praying that for your lives every day. I get up early, and I take time in prayer, and I pray for my family. I pray for my church family. I pray for my brothers and sisters around the world, and I ask God to transform to transform miraculously. Now, listen to me, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. God can't work a miracle in your life if you, re if you neglect the Word of God because the Word of God is the key to having the miracle from God. But guess what? If you neglect it, if you reject it, if you... Say, no, I, I really like the, what I think is right. I want to choose for myself what's right. Well, then you can't have a miracle of transformation. Because in order to be transformed by the Spirit of God, it says it's when we look into God's Word that we're transformed into Christ's image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. So if, if Christians don't look into God's Word, don't listen to it, don't read it, don't ponder it, don't meditate in it. Don't memorize it. Guess what? We will always have less than the, mirac the, the miracle God wants us to have, the miracle of transformation. We've got to be in God's Word. So I just want to encourage you in this series. To, I want us to learn a lot about God's Word, but I also want to encourage you on a practical level to say, don't neglect it. Take it in. You will know the truth. The truth will make you free. It'll do amazing things in all of our lives, in our church. Do you want this church to be transformed? Then, as a church body, we've got to be people of the word. All right? All right. So let's take out our communion cups and spend some time thinking about our Lord Jesus and worshiping him. So just peel that top layer off and get the little communion host How we praise our Lord Jesus. If you need one, just come on down. Yeah, please, I'm sorry. If you need one, raise your hand. Jeff will be happy to help you. But as you hold that little wafer in your hands, Jesus, he took bread the night before he was crucified for our sins, and he broke that bread, and he gave it to the disciples that were all around the table, and he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. He wanted us to remember. He wanted us to remember that he paid the ultimate price. He doesn't want us to forget what he endured. And that's important. You know why? Because when the going gets tough, when we suffer and go through really hard times, you know what? Um... If we forget about how Jesus suffered for us, we may struggle to be able to suffer the way he wants us to for him. So thankfully, we have this time where we meditate and we think about our Lord Jesus and say, thank you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Appreciate you, Lord. Thank you for all that you did for me on the cross of Calvary. Thankfully, we, we got to sing about that this morning. Awesome music about the cross. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me.
So be real careful with this next one because it's kind of hard to get the top off. And nobody needs grape juice on their nice Sunday clothes. And of course, the cup of juice reminds us of the blood of Jesus, which reminds us of his death, his death. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so without the loss of blood that brought Jesus' death about, without that shedding of blood, we would all be doomed. We would all be damned for eternity. We would be in terrible straits. There would be nothing we could do. You could do what the people in India do and get a bed of nails and lay on that bed of nails, but guess what? Nothing we could ever, ever do could atone for our sins. We could never atone for our own sins. So Jesus came. He came and died, and the nails were put into his wrists and into his feet and the crown of thorns and all the suffering he endured. And ultimately, he gave up the spirit. He died. And our sins were paid for by his precious blood. The old hymn said, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, no other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's do this in remembrance of him and say our motto together next time with Christ. Ready? Next time with Christ. You may put those in the rack in front of you there, and they'll be picked up later. But let me pray over you as you are dismissed. I just pray that today has been an awesome day. I so look forward to uh, the next several weeks. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible fellowship class that you're attending, we're doing a uh, a video series on the Red Sea Miracle. It's awesome. It's about all that scholars say, and scholars on this side, scholars on that side, and we're trying to get to, again, the truth of God's word about what God really did when the Red Sea was parted. Was it just some kind of human thing, or was there really a divine miracle? All those kind of issues, it's awesome. And so, and of course, we've got other Bible fellowship classes uh, as well that you could take advantage of. But let me pray for you, and then also we'll pray for the Scarlet family as well as they prepare for the viewing and for the funeral today. Father in heaven, we praise you for your word. And Lord, we praise you that, um, God, your word is truth. Not a truth, the truth. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus because he is the truth and your word is truth. And so, Father, we praise you for that. We praise you that we have true north. We praise you that we have a perfect compass in your word and that, Lord, it's the perfect guide for our lives. And I pray that your word would become more real than ever in every single person in this congregation. God, I just pray that, it'll, that they'll, they will all take it in so that we can be what you want us to be for you, Lord. God, bless your people. Be with those who suffer this week, Lord. Illness, be with those uh, who are suffering the loss of family members, Lord. The Sarals are traveling back from Florida. They uh, were there for the... Uh, funeral yesterday of Terry and Robert's friend who lost her husband, her two sons, in one week to COVID. Husband and two sons. We pray for that family. We pray for the Scarlets, Lord, who lost their patriarch, Noel. God, give them extra special grace. Bless your people. Give them safety as they travel home. And Lord, Give them a tremendous week this week. And we ask all these things in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you all that joined us online. God bless.